Be at war with your vices, at peace with your neighbors, and let every new year find you a better person. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the History Obscura Reading Room. And welcome to a new solar year, too. If you're listening to my voice right now, congratulations on so far outmaneuvering the plague. Or perhaps you haven't, but your spirit is rather keen to stick around a wee bit more. I wish you a pleasant ethereality. I know that Frank and Tito, Colonel Butler, and the various undead creatures of the estate enjoy making nuisances of themselves immensely. So, bon santé! Let's begin. Once upon a time, on May 26th of 1828, in fact, a teenage boy walked stiffly into the city of Nuremberg in the kingdom of Bavaria. He walked into a nearly deserted square in Nuremberg holding a letter. His speech made no sense. It consisted of a few set phrases he seemed to have been taught, but did not seem to understand. The boy insisted that he wanted to be taken to the nearest military regiment so he could sign up and ride a horse like his father had done. The particular regiment that the boy asked for did not exist in Nuremberg, and so the boy was brought, eventually, to the police. The police found that the boy could write, but only a name, Kasper Hauser. The authorities assumed this was the boy's own name. So Kasper Hauser was offered meat and alcohol, but he was unable to tolerate anything but bread and water. The authorities judged him a vagrant and possibly a hoaxer, and he was imprisoned in a high tower. Casper spent the following two months in Lungesland Tower in Nuremberg Castle in the care of a jailer named Andreas Hiltel. Hiltel, after prolonged observation, concluded the boy to be totally innocent and with a mental age of perhaps three. As a consequence, he was released into the jailer's own home. With some education and personal tutoring, Casper eventually was able to tell his own story. He said, as far back as he could remember, he had been kept chained to a wall in a low-ceilinged chamber, where he could not stand, but where bread and water were within his reach when he awoke. Apart from a toy horse and toy dog, he had come to believe himself to be totally alone in this twilight world, until, when the boy was 15, his jailer finally appeared. The jailer gave him a crash course in walking, taught him to write his name, and to mimic a few sentences. Casper was then dragged and carried to the quiet square in Nuremberg where he was left wobbling unsteadily with his letter. During his time in the tower prison, Casper attracted both compassion and cruelty, and this dual reaction continued for his entire life. Visitors made him eat and drink things that threw him into fits or exposed him to loud explosions. His complete ignorance of fire and mirrors provided the occasion for much callous hilarity. The boy's senses were abnormally acute. He could distinguish between colors in relative darkness. He had strong and differing reactions to minerals even when they were covered. His sense of smell and sensitivity to movement were also highly developed. Furthermore, he had a phenomenal memory. What struck people the most was the boy's sweet, innocent, and loving nature, and his total lack of any desire to see people punished who had maltreated him. Hauser was formally adopted by the town of Nuremberg, and money was donated for his upkeep and education. The president of the Bavarian Court of Appeals, one Paul von Feuerbach, decided to investigate the case. 
Fearback arranged for Casper's transfer to the home of Frederick Daumer, a teacher who had been visiting Casper regularly in prison. Daumer took it upon himself to be responsible not only for the boy's education, but for his health and general welfare. He also wrote three books about his charge. The boy flourished under his care and astoundingly was soon able to write, paint, and play the piano. He could also ride a horse and began to draw beautiful pictures. Dalmer subjected him to homeopathy and magnetic experiments as well. And as Feuerbach told it, when Professor Dalmer held the north pole of a magnet towards him, Casper put his hand to the pit of his stomach and drawing his waistcoat in an outward direction, said that it drew him thus and that a current of air seemed to proceed from him. The south pole affected him less powerfully and he said that it blew upon him. In October of 1828, the Dalmer household found Casper cowering in the basement, bleeding from a cut on his head. According to the boy, a hooded stranger had attacked him, though it has been suggested that the young man, suffering from depression and anxiety, caused the wound himself. In either case, he was sent to live with a friend of Dalmer's in the center of the city, which was deemed safer. This episode of History Obscura is sponsored by BetterHelp, because, let's face it, the ghostly whispers have been getting louder recently. Are you having trouble sorting through all the noise in your brain? Are you just feeling trapped? Overburdened? Misunderstood or unheard? Is something wrong that you can't quite put in words? BetterHelp employs professional counselors who are specialized in topics like depression, anxiety, LGBT issues, grief, anger, and many more. And of course, anything you share is confidential. If you could use some support, take a look at the testimonials of satisfied people on the BetterHelp website. And if you're struggling, reach out. As a listener of this show, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com forward slash listener. That's betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com forward slash listen. In the home of Gottlieb von Tucher, Casper's spirits lifted again. Of course, people still wondered at his origins. The lengths that seemingly had been taken to conceal the boy from the world and erase any trace of his history led people to come up with their own theories about where Casper came from. Perhaps, many thought, he was an unwanted royal relative. Too noble to die, but too dangerous somehow to know his heritage. Rumors flew, linking Casper to the English crown, the Hungarian crown, and to the royal house of Baden, which was an imperial estate of the Holy Roman Empire. It was in May of 1831 that the Englishman Philip Henry, 4th Earl of Stanhope, visited Nuremberg precisely to investigate those rumors. Stanhope appears to have been in the employ of the royal house of Baden, and he succeeded in so impressing the citizens of Nuremberg with his apparent compassion that he was permitted to adopt Casper. After the adoption, Casper was removed from his friends in Nuremberg and placed in a house in nearby Ansbach. The house was run by a somewhat dull schoolmaster, Herr Meyer. Herr Meyer is said to have resented the affection Casper inspired and, even before his arrival, had thought him an imposter. Stanhope left him there, promising to collect him later and take him back to Chevening House, his home in Kent. But this promise never materialized. Casper's champion and chief friend in Ansbeck continued to be Fjordbeck. He had written the first book about Casper, now regarded as a German classic, A Crime Against the Human Soul. 
But Fearback died suddenly in May of 1833, believing himself to have been poisoned. At the end of this same year, on the afternoon of December 14th, Casper was lured into Ansbeck's town park with the promise of revelations as to the identity of his mother. There, he was presented with a silk purse, inside of which was an intricately folded piece of paper and on it a message in mirror writing. As he opened and began to read the letter, Casper was stabbed in the chest. He struggled home, but then returned to the park dragged by the schoolteacher Meyer, who did not believe the story and wanted proof. They found the purse and the note, but the boy collapsed on his way home again, and he died three days later, on the night of December 17. The message from the park read, Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself from where I come. I come from, and here it is undecipherable, the Bavarian border, on the river, undecipherable. I will even tell you the name, M-L-O. After extensive research before his sudden death, Fjordback had come to believe that Caspar was in fact the eldest son of Karl, Grand Duke of Baden, and his wife Stephanie, who was a relation by marriage of Napoleon's wife, Josephine de Bucarnet. On September 29th of 1812, Stephanie had had a baby boy and grandson to Napoleon. However, two weeks later, the baby was declared to be sick and dying, and both the mother and wet nurse were prevented from seeing the child, apparently to protect them from a sight that might upset them. As expected, the child died. Many people have come to believe that the child did not die, but was in fact substituted with the dying child of a servant woman. As Karl, Grand Duke of Baden, had no surviving male progeny, his successor became his uncle Louis, later succeeded by his half-brother Leopold. And therefore it was Leopold's mother, the Countess of Hochberg, who was the alleged culprit for the plot. The Countess was supposed to have disguised herself as a ghost called the White Lady when kidnapping the prince. Her motive was to secure the succession for her own sons. When Lord Stanhope did finally turn up again in Ansbach, it was to begin an 18-month campaign to persuade the world that his apparently beloved adopted son, Casper, had been an imposter all along. Evidence flooded in from both sides. Mrs. Meyer, the wife of the young man's most recent school teacher and patron, remarked that the mysterious note given to Casper in the park was folded into a specific triangular form, much in the same way which Hauser would fold his own letters. She and her husband believed Casper had stabbed himself, probably in a bid for attention gone wrong. Forensic examiners agreed that the wound might indeed have been self-inflicted. It may have been an attempt to prod Stanhope into fulfilling his promise to take Casper to England. In 1996, an analysis of blood, thought to have been from Hauser's own clothing, was made in the laboratories of the Forensic Science Service in Birmingham and at the Institute of Legal Medicine at the University of Munich. Comparisons with descendants of the House of Baden showed that the blood from the specimen could not have come from the hereditary prince. However, in 2002, the Institute for Forensic Medicine of the University of Munster analyzed hair and body cells from locks of hair and items of clothing that also belonged to Caspar Hauser. The analysts took six different DNA samples all of which turned out to be identical. All, however, differed substantially from the blood sample examined in 1996, 
the authenticity of which was therefore questioned. The new DNA samples were compared to a DNA segment from Astrid von Mendiger, a descendant in the female line of Stephanie de Beauharnais. The sequences were not identical, but the deviation observed is not large enough to exclude a relationship, as the difference could be caused by a mutation. The church authorities in Ansbach have stolidly refused to allow the exhumation of the grave where Caspar is buried. Equally stubborn was the refusal of the Baden Grand Ducal descendants to allow the family vault in Forsheim to be opened and investigated, to see if the dead prince who lay there was indeed the son of Stephanie. That changed in 2012, and the vault was finally opened. The coffins containing the remains of the child who had supposedly died after two weeks, along with that of a younger brother, Alexander, who had died after one week of life, were missing. As for Caspar Hauser, he was buried in the Stadtfriedhof Cemetery in Ansbach, where his headstone reads, in Latin, Here lies Caspar Hauser riddle of his time. His birth was unknown, his death mysterious. 1833. Please support the podcast by sharing episodes, leaving great reviews, checking out the show's sponsors, visiting our Patreon, or buying us a cup of tea. Your support keeps the show going, so thank you, and good night. Mm-hmm.